There is a side of refugee camps that you've seen before and a side that you have not. My name is Karen Muller. I filmed the horror of war firsthand, but never really knew what happened to the civilians who fled during the strife. So I decided to spend three months alone in a Sudanese refugee camp to see how people who've lost everything rebuild their lives from scratch. Nothing prepared me for what I found. If you're going to understand the refugee camps, you have to know what their lives were like before the war in peaceful villages scattered throughout Western Sudan. The women were responsible for almost all the daily chores, like hauling water. They took great pride in making sure their families always had clean clothes. They taught their daughters so that they would attract good husbands and marry well. It was the men's responsibility to protect the village with whatever weapons they could make or find. They also worked communally on larger construction projects, like building houses for new wives. The materials all came from the surrounding forest, and the know-how got passed on from father to son. There was no such thing as retirement. Everyone just worked until they dropped dead. Though the elderly were treated with great respect, it was their job to teach the next generation all the skills they needed to grow up into proper men. Abdullah is almost blind and has to tie the knots by feel, but his teeth still work just fine. Beyond a certain age, even women no longer had to follow rules of etiquette. Children were given chores and responsibilities at an early age. By the time they turned 10, they were full working members of the community, in charge of all the family assets. That didn't mean they couldn't still be kids. If a ball should find its way into the village, they'd play until it was too dark to see. From time to time, the Arab nomads passed through on their annual migration. They traded milk and meat for grain and the right to graze their animals. The two groups didn't mix that much, but relationships were usually cordial. Aside from that, there was very little commerce. No stores, no need, since everything could be grown or gathered. <laughs> Even seeds that, when dried, were sweet as candy. <laughs> and as a bonus, their pits could be pressed for oil. The local market, if there was one, was at least a day's hard ride away. It was a place to sell any excess harvest and buy a few luxuries, or parlay special skills into a bit of extra cash. Any good-sized town was almost certainly out of reach, though once or twice a year, the men would make the journey to sell livestock, or buy a new amulet, or knife and sheath. The country's capital, Khartoum was a world away, inconceivable. Though lately, a few Western inventions were just starting to creep in. Time didn't just move slowly in these rural villages. To all intents and purposes, it stopped 500 years ago. No phones, no cars, no electricity no television sets. In fact, there was nothing more important than hanging out with family and friends. 
These were social societies, not economic ones. Extended families and interpersonal relationships were the only things that really mattered. It was a simple life, but not completely idyllic. In the desert, almost everything has thorns, and few people could afford a pair of shoes. So removing splinters was a daily chore. And the flies were everywhere. With no access to hospitals, diseases like arthritis and diabetes went virtually unchecked. During the dry season, the dust storms could make life completely miserable. It was a harsh and unforgiving land, but for those who knew every rock and outcrop, it was home. And then, there came a war. It began with drought, turning farmland into desert, and pitting sedentary African farmers and the nomadic Arab herders against each other in a desperate competition over increasingly scarce resources. The Sudanese government sided with the Arab herder, and throughout Darfur, farming villages were burnt to the ground and their inhabitants slaughtered. Those who survived fled over the border into Chad to begin a new life in the camps. At first glance, Farshana camp is pretty much what you'd expect. The women spend hours hauling water. The children play a lot of soccer, and if they're lucky, go to school. Once a month, there's a food distribution. But mostly, you see people sitting under trees and assume there's nothing much to do. You don't realize that behind the scenes, almost everyone is working frantically because you can't survive inside the camp without some form of extra cash. <laughs> if your goal is to make money, selling stuff is the way to go. You have a captive audience of 20,000. No matter how poor they are, they still need shoes and children's clothes, soap and toothpaste and candy. Though if they can't afford the commercial version, they can buy the local brand. Wedding dresses and cheaper ones for daily use. Even the occasional luxuries like noodles, pencils and tea. There's local honey in those soda bottles. And toothbrushes, either imported or the poor man's brand. The problem is, you need money to buy your merchandise, and most refugees arrive at the camp without a lot of cash. A few have managed to pull money from their extended family and use it to open up their own store. Mohammed sells everything from batteries to bubble gum. He learned the trade by working in an older brother's shop before the war. By now, he saved enough to hire a truck and orders his supplies from Abeche town, three hours away. His sons do all the heavy lifting. Mohammed just shows up to keep an eye on things. He mostly sells to other storekeepers, so he no longer has to sit inside his shop and wait for customers to come to him. The extra cash has allowed him to try his hand at other businesses, like money changing, and focus on growing his family. With more money, he can buy more wives. At 52, he just married for the third time. He has to build a house and cover living expenses for each and every wife. In fact, this is just another long-term investment. More wives mean more children, and kids are the unpaid workforce that run Mohammed's growing empire. This son squeezes fresh tamarind juice each day and takes it to the local market. 
seven kilometers outside of camp. In Sudanese society, wealth comes with responsibility. Mohammed not only provides for his immediate family, but also sisters, cousins, and aunts. He has over 50 mouths to feed. And when friends drop by, he's expected to take care of them as well. But Mohammed's well respected in the community. When there's a meeting, people listen when he speaks. In this society, that's worth almost anything. But there are easier ways to get rich in the refugee camps, and this is one of them. The monthly grain distribution has to be ground into flour before it can be eaten. An extraordinarily exhausting process. Several years ago, the humanitarian agencies gave a mill to each block of refugees with the understanding that they would be operated for the benefit of the community. Those who ran them were supposed to charge a small amount for fuel and the cost of their labor. Once a month, the women bring their grain distribution to the miller, where it goes into a queue. He gives them a receipt, and the few who can afford it pay the fee. The weight can stretch for hours, but it still beats doing it yourself. <laughs> Unfortunately, ownership of the equipment gradually migrated into the hands of just a few families, who now take half the grain in payment from those who don't have cash. The mill owners then resell it, illegally, on the open market. It's turned them into the richest families in the camp. No one dares complain, especially those who just arrived without a penny to their names. Typically, you'll find them making bricks. It's one of the toughest jobs in the camp. On the upside, you need almost no capital, just a simple wooden mold, a shovel, and an enormous amount of sweat. The first step is to claim a spot where the sand has enough clay to hold it together. Since these are among the poorest families, children often end up working for their parents and then don't have time or energy to get an education. Once they've chipped it loose, they add water and knead the mixture until it's smooth. They then drag it to a flat spot, mold it, and leave it to dry in the blistering sun. In the village, this would have been a job for men, but here there are too many widowed women, all struggling to support themselves. Because the bricks are never fired, they break easily. It takes 1,200 bricks to build a one-room hut at a cost of about two cents a piece. That's $24. Of course, once you have a house, you need to furnish it. Because of cold desert nights and rainy season floods, bed frames are an absolute necessity. Carpenters are in big demand. Carving bed frames out of wood doesn't need a lot of tools or capital, but it's slow, hard work. And the finished beds rarely sell for more than a couple of bucks. It's these guys who have figured out how to really cash in. They've converted an old grain mill into a homemade welder. Their bed frames sell for more than the house you put them in. A haircut, on the other hand, will run you about 10 cents. The barber shops are behind the butcher stalls. Most men want their haircut as short as possible in the itchy summer heat. It also helps keep down lice, ringworm, and fleas. You don't need much to start a barber shop. A broken mirror and a brush or comb if you can't afford the clippers, then a cheap pair of scissors will do. 
and a place to sit. The final touches, and he's done. Even when they're not at work, the refugees are supposed to stay inside the camp. But a few have made private deals with the surrounding Chadian villagers to plant gardens on a dry riverbed an hour's walk outside the walls. Abdul pays the landowners 50% of his harvest for the right to use the land and access to a local well. The water table has dropped several feet since the camp was established. That fact has turned local Chadian villagers against the Sudanese refugees, since they depend on the same water. Unlike the Arab herders, the Sudanese refugees are people of the soil. Farming is in their blood. One of their greatest fears is that their children will not learn the necessary skills to grow crops once they finally go home. Abdul's daily harvest represents some of the few fresh vegetables available in the camp market for 20,000 people. The dropping water table isn't just a local problem. Throughout the region, the land is drying out. Even if these refugees find their way home, they almost certainly can't go back to subsistence farming. At least for now, Abdul's vegetables are hot commodities. Before he even gets them to market, he sold half of what he picked. Unlike fresh vegetables, drinking water is available to all the refugees, though they still need some way to store it once they get it back to their huts. Making water pots is typically a job for women. First, Fatma prepares a place to work that needs the clay. She dug this batch out of a dry riverbed over 10 kilometers away. Her mother taught her how to shape pots, and without a husband in the camps, this is how she supports her three children. It takes about an hour to shape a single pot, including the occasional break. Once she's done, Fatma gathers what little wood she can find and heads out to the open desert to prepare the fire. The extra stones help keep in the heat. No matter how carefully she packs it, the wood chips come up short. So she adds dried cow manure scavenged from the local Arab herders. There's not much entertainment in the camp. The fire draws quite a crowd. The pot is only fired once, which means it's porous. The water gradually leaks through. This acts as a natural air conditioning and keeps the contents cool. Fatma will feed the fire until well after dark. All that work, and they sell for less than $2 each. Not all of Fatma's pots get used for storing water. These women are selling homemade beer, despite the fact that alcohol is forbidden by both the government and Islam. The women brew it from whatever grain they have on hand, usually sorghum, since it's cheap. The more it bubbles, the more alcohol it contains. By afternoon, it's already turning sour, and then it's a race to sell it by day's end. Luckily, they have plenty of clientele. The men have staked out almost every square inch of nearby shade. Like any good businesswoman, she's happy to give prospective customers a free taste. But not all the refugees have time to sit around and drink. Just around the corner, the tanners have been hard at work since dawn. They bought a batch of hides from a local butcher and have to soak them in a vat of ash and water before they start to rot. They'll pull them out daily to remove the hair. It gets dried and sold for stuffing. 
Ten days later, any remaining flesh is scraped off. Yeah. Yeah. These are among the poorest workers in the camp. They barely make enough to feed themselves. Their wives and daughters are kept busy hauling water. Though the men have by far the tougher job, they have to scrub each and every hide for hours on end. And in the process, it does a real number on their hands. After two long weeks, they're almost done. But the moment the hides dry out, they stiffen up again. So they get pounded and scraped one more time. And then sold for 90 cents. The butchers, on the other hand, are the envy of the camp. The Sudanese love meat and it's not included in their monthly food distribution. This is not an easy job to get. First, only men who have been circumcised can do this. Women and boys are not allowed to slaughter animals to eat. Secondly, you have to know the rules. According to Islamic law, the death must be quick and merciful, using a sharp knife, and the blood immediately drained from the body. But most importantly, you must have enough money to buy the animal in the first place. Goats cost around $20, sheep are closer to 40 and a cow can go for as much as 200 bucks. Gamar is quite the expert at what comes next. He's been doing this for over 30 years. The best way to remove the skin is to cut a hole and blow. It inflates the carcass like a balloon and makes it easy to remove. The skin will eventually get sold to the tanners down the hill. Within 30 minutes, the goat is in pieces and ready for the cooking pot. A cow takes a good deal longer. They use every single part, even the half-digested grass inside the stomach. The intestines are hung out like laundry or tied off into sausages with their contents still inside. The rest of the animal is tastefully displayed. Gamar is sold out by noon. And that's when he goes home and starts his other job, as a camp surgeon. He'll treat almost any injury, and in some ways this actually makes sense. He has a lot of experience in cutting up animals. He's not afraid of blood, and he doesn't mind causing a little pain. And in the end, is the inside of a cow really that different from a man? When a four-year-old boy gets a compound fracture falling off a donkey, his parents immediately call Gamar to patch him up again. In this close-knit camp of 20,000, any misfortune brings out an army of relatives and friends. Gamar spends 20 minutes greeting everyone before he even asks to see his patient. The accident occurred at 10 p.m. With no electricity, Gamar had to set the bone by candlelight. And he's come back today to look at it again. When a bone breaks through the skin, I clean it very well and then gently put it back where it was and then I bandage it. Gamar uses no anesthetic, just sulfa powder, sackcloth, and cardboard splints. And his secret ingredient, 
a raw chicken skin. His technique may not be the most up to date, but his bedside manner is wonderful. Don't cry, I fixed your leg. As soon as possible, you'll get better. When I go to market, I'll bring you sweets and biscuits. But the refugees fear illness even more than injuries. And they have a lot of superstitions about what makes them sick. They believe that the uvula, which hangs down the back of the throat and looks like a worm, causes diarrhea in children. The solution is to take it out, and Muhammad is the man to do it. He uses a rusty metal hook and a wooden stick, and he performs a dozen surgeries every morning before it gets too hot to work. It cures a sick person. The vomiting goes away, and the diarrhea also goes away. Hygiene isn't his strongest point. But then, he only charges 50 cents, and the medicine is free. The children are incredibly resilient. They're breastfeeding within minutes, and in an hour, they're ready to play. Despite their best efforts, the Sudanese still get sick from time to time. So what should you do if you're a refugee and you feel under the weather? Your first stop is the mullah, your local Islamic elder. He'll listen to your symptoms while you share some boiled dough. This is a traditional Muslim society, and inshallah, God willing, and if you're a true believer, then you will get well again. Once the mullah's heard enough to make a diagnosis, he pulls out a wooden tablet and writes verses, surahs, from the Quran. He then washes the ink into a bowl. You drink that sacred water and pass it around. If you can't drink the water immediately, then the mullah will kindly mix it with some sorghum flour, smear it on a plate, and put it in the sun to dry. As it turns out, you don't actually have to be ill to seek the mullah's blessing. He specializes in making grigri, religious amulets. He writes verses from the Quran onto a sheet of paper, folds it carefully, and sews it into a perfect square. He then takes it to the market, where it gets tucked inside a leather pouch, decorated, and covered in shoe polish. Grigri can deflect bullets and even make the wearer invisible. Not surprisingly, they're hot sellers among the Chadian soldiers at a nearby army camp. They buy extra to wrap around the things they most want to protect. So, if the mullah's sacred water doesn't cure you, and you get sick despite his amulets, he'll send you to a specialist. For long-term aches or pains, the bleeder's your best bet. He'll make several small cuts over the affected area and then use a cow's horn to create a vacuum and draw out the blood. After 20 minutes, he releases the pressure, scrapes it clean, spits to create a new seal, and does it all over again. The blood coagulates within minutes in the searing desert heat. To Muslims, all body parts are sacred, so burying the blood is more important than cleaning up the wound. Bleeding is a common practice throughout the camp. This man has chronic pain, 
so his wife has learned to do it and has even purchased a new razor blade for the occasion. He's been ill for more than 10 years. Last year he almost died, but I cut him and he got better. Now I cut him every two to three weeks and he feels good. After 300 treatments, she's almost run out of skin. When she cuts me, it hurts a lot, but afterwards I feel better in my stomach. And when she uses the horn and the blood comes out, the pain is gone for a while. The Sudanese have even come up with cures for contagious diseases. Hepatitis A, for example, is treated by the burner. He also handles fever and joint pain. His mother taught him the technique and still hangs around to keep an eye on things. Today he's curing a young woman. And her biggest worry isn't getting burned with a hot iron. It's disrobing in front of a strange man. An aunt has been sent along to chaperone. The young girl covers up as much as possible and tries not to show her embarrassment and, less importantly, her pain. <laughs> he burns seven places on her arms and legs. He still needs to burn her back and promises to turn away. Her chaperone keeps an eagle eye on him. Hepatitis A is rarely fatal, so no matter what he gives her, she's almost sure to get well again. Though even if it doesn't work, she's still not completely out of options. There are plenty of Western medicines in the marketplace. For animals, or humans. Most refugees have no idea which ones to buy and can't read labels. So they usually go to see Victor, the self-taught camp pharmacist. He treats everything from diarrhea to serious infections. And his waiting room is always packed. He sees almost 200 patients a day. Victor's training is somewhat rudimentary. In Sudan, I took a first aid course. Despite an almost total lack of facilities or training, Victor taught himself how to give IVs. And he never misses the vein. Unlike the butcher or the bleeder, Victor knows his limits. I'll, the bad illnesses, I send them to the hospital. Though he hasn't quite figured out his stethoscope. That gives the temperature of the patient. Or blood pressure cuff. There are some people, their blood is not flowing well. But he takes the time to explain the proper dosage to each and every patient, even if the diagnosis isn't always right. Victor has a lot of clients because he is trusted by the community. Though it doesn't hurt that he's willing to give out prescription medications to anyone who asks. He even built his clinic with the boxes that he bought them in. He imports them from nearby Abeche town and makes a tidy profit reselling to his clients. He needs the money since... I have four wives. He sees my surprise. <laughs> and 18 children. I can't help myself. Why so many children? God gave them to me. <laughs> and why so many wives? They are my uncle's daughters. They gave them to me. By Muslim standards, Victor is a very successful man. With so many local healers, it might surprise you that there's a Doctors Without Borders hospital right inside the camp. It has Western-trained doctors and modern medicines. And everything is free. 
They even have a nutrition center that provides extra food for children that aren't putting on enough weight. The staff keep careful records, weigh and measure every patient on a weekly basis, and try to calm their fears and make them healthy again. They really care about every child who comes through their doors. Ivan, their director, works hard to build trust within the Sudanese community. Despite his best efforts, the hospital's waiting rooms are almost empty. Why? Because the refugees want a cure. They want it now. And they don't see the point of all those silly measurements and scribbling. The refugees are just looking for something that makes sense to them. They've lost everything. Their villages, their possessions, their family and friends. And they're living in a bleak and soulless camp without any idea when or if they'll ever go home again. But underneath it all, they are an extraordinarily resilient people. No matter what their circumstances, they hang on to their customs and traditions and make sure to teach the next generation, even when the lessons are anything but pleasant. Abdul has just turned seven, and he's about to discover what it takes to become a man. Today is his circumcision. He's not entirely sure how it's going to happen, but he knows it's going to hurt. He tries hard to pretend that he doesn't care. It's important that he doesn't show any sign of fear. But his hands give him away. The guy who's coming to do the surgery is already half an hour late. And the suspense is driving Abdul insane. When the man finally shows up, it turns out to be Victor, the self-taught pharmacist. He greets everyone and then sits down for a nice long chat with Abdul's dad. By the time Victor's ready to do the procedure, Abdul is at his wit's end. No one seems in any hurry. Victor does half a dozen circumcisions every day over the summer. And Abdul's dad has gone through this with his four other sons. Abdul has no choice but to watch all the preparations, from scalpel to syringe. When it's finally time for the needle, seven-year-old Abdul barely flinches. He's actually getting off easy. Back home, they would have held him down and done it without anesthetic. A clamp, a cut, and the deed is done. Unfortunately, the needle is old and rather blunt. Through it all, Abdul never made a sound. I'm very happy. He's just like me. So what's different now that Abdul is a man? He can cut animals for food and get married and carry a gun. Though for the moment, a sword will have to do. They all thank Allah. And then the neighborhood women congratulate both father and son. Normally there would be a day-long feast for the entire village, but Abdul's mother lives in a different camp, and his father has no money to pay for a big celebration. So the local women do what they can. The young boys watch and dream of the day when they too will become men. All too soon the women have to go home and cook for their own families. The men retire to their tent to drink and smoke and Abdul is left to brave it out alone. But not all local traditions are quite so painful. The Sudanese love a party 
And when someone gets married, they pull out all the stops. Everyone puts on their one nice outfit, and the bleak brown camp turns colorful for an afternoon. The young men and women gather in a local space and sing and jump. It shows they're healthy and, more importantly, impresses members of the opposite sex. Some of them are human pogo sticks. It helps if you kick up your feet. This is one of the few places that unmarried men and women can look for potential mates. Though the women are a lot more shy about it than the men. More than anything, in the dreary monotony of camp life, it's a chance for young people to break out and have a little fun. To those lucky few who are invited to the wedding itself, things don't look that different. Just crammed into a much smaller space. The young boys join the celebration. The girls get extra chores. There are a few perks to being related to the bride and groom. The men get new clothes for the occasion and a pair of shades and access to the illegal stash of alcohol. Every once in a while, someone runs around and sprays cologne on all the guests. Probably a good thing, given how hot it is. The mother of the bride is having a fantastic time. Seeing her daughter safely married means she's fulfilled her most important obligation. Normally there would be lots of food, but all they can afford is sweetened gruel. And there's only enough for the men. But if this is just a poor man's version, what does a real Sudanese wedding look like? As it turns out, there's one about to happen in Gosbeda, just south of camp. The daughter of the Sultan is going to tie the knot. The entire town turns out to celebrate. They even bring out a few musical instruments. And everyone is dancing the traditional tom-tom, complete with long-handled fans. The older people love this part. Everyone seems to be enjoying the spectacle. It doesn't hurt that they may go home a little wealthier than they came. The soldiers are all from the groom's side of the family. Turns out the Sultan's daughter is marrying the son of a general. But the real preparation started weeks ago, when several dozen members of the bride's extended family arrived from the capital to help. The Sultan rented them a house and quickly built a wall around it to protect them from prying eyes. Piles of raw ingredients were delivered and they began to prepare a feast. Because the Sudanese have large and extended families, the guest list can run to several hundred people. That's not good news for the local chickens. The highlight of the feast will be a huge pot of assorted meats and other delicacies. There are also gifts, some for the bride, and some to hand out to guests. 
The host's reputation will depend on how much money he spends. Happily for him, this is a Muslim country, so technically he doesn't have to spring for alcohol. The bride herself is nowhere to be seen. She's off getting scrubbed and bathed and covered in scented oils. The groom provides the wedding bed and the women cover it with tasty treats. Back at the Sultan's house, the public celebration is finally coming to an end. It's time to head out to a rented courtyard for a more private dance with family and friends. The general kindly provides the transportation. Unfortunately, they're way behind schedule and still setting up the all-important lights and music. And it's about to rain. Some guests have arrived early. The lucky ones are under awnings. The rest are just going to get wet. At least the bridal party is warm and dry inside a nearby house. For most of the women, this is their one chance to wear their fanciest clothes and high heel shoes, henna their hands, and show off any accessories they own. Though the weather is making a mess of things, they finally decide to fix the dance floor, though for some, it's already too late. At last, the groom is here, three hours late. He doesn't dance, but he does do periodic victory laps. He also hands out a lot of cash. His entourage come with their own accessories. The singer and his band have their share of loyal fans as well. The women don't have to wait to be asked to dance, mostly because they're not dancing with the men. Though as time goes on, things get more and more risque. It's the Sudanese equivalent of dirty dancing. Suddenly, the bride arrives. They cover her from head to toe, and the groom helps her to her seat. What little you can see of her is beautifully decorated. Eventually, she's allowed to show her face. She must be a little overwhelmed. She's only just turned 15, and she's barely met her future husband. All too soon is time for her to leave again, in slow motion. Her snapping fingers are the only hint that she'd really like to stay and dance. Once she's gone, her female relatives can finally show themselves. They make quite an entrance in the hopes that they too might one day catch a man. By midnight, the dance is over, and the next morning the women are back at their daily chores. They still have to finish preparing the big feast and serve it to the men. The guys have been busy working up an appetite since early morning. <laughs> They'll eat first. The women get whatever might be left over. But first, they have over 500 mouths to feed. Last night must already feel like a distant memory. How much harder must life be for the girls in the refugee camps? And yet, what they're missing in material possessions, they make up for in family and social relationships. 
and a strong moral code and value system. Mostly thanks to people like Abu Bakr. He is a camp mualim, a Quranic teacher. Every morning and evening, his students gather in a shelter that doubles as a Quranic school. All ages are welcome. The older kids take care of younger siblings. Abu Bakr doesn't teach per se. He sings passages from the Quran, which his kids then sing back to him. More or less. Most can't afford Qurans or even paper. So the boys write in ink on communal wooden tablets, then wash them clean again. Most girls don't know how to read. Abu Bakr has three wives and seven children, and he doesn't charge a penny for his services. So he has to have another way to make ends meet. When he's not teaching Quranic school, Abu Bakr is a baker. It's grueling work. I have to get up at 4 a.m., wash the towels, chop the firewood, fire the oven, mix the flour and water. Then I start to work. By the time his assistant climbs out of bed, Abu Bakr has been hard at work for almost three hours. And they still have over 400 loaves to bake. They sell some bread to family and friends. But if Abu Bakr is going to stay in business, then he has to sell at the local market, seven kilometers away. Why does Abu Bakr work so hard? He has one wish in life. When I came here, I was very happy for one reason. My children are getting an education. Abu Bakr sees no conflict between his Quranic teaching and a Western education. In fact, he schedules his classes around school hours. The two, he says, go hand in hand. The Quran teaches moral values. The Western school teaches practical knowledge. What kind of values? Be honest. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't lie. Don't covet. Sounds awfully familiar. Abu Bakr does more than talk. He lives the values that he preaches. When his neighbor needs help building a home for his new wife, Abu Bakr is the first one there. He works the hardest, and he's the last to leave. All the children know that if they hang around his oven, they're sure to get free bread. As if he wasn't busy enough already, Abu Bakr is teaching himself how to sew. And then it's time for evening class. If this is what the Quran teaches, Abu Bakr's students are in good hands. The refugees lost everything. And when they reached the camp, they had to start from scratch. And yet, they don't give up no matter how bad things get. They help each other whenever possible, and they still find ways to enjoy themselves. If we were in their shoes, would we do as well? For information about how to use Sudan's secret side in the classroom, including storytelling and multimedia educational opportunities, visit sudanssecretside.org. Sudan's Secret Side, a two-hour documentary series, is available on DVD for $24.95, plus shipping and handling.
The series may also be downloaded for purchase or rental. To order online, please visit www.sudansecretside.com. This program is brought to you in part by Take Two, turning today's youth into tomorrow's global citizens. www.take2videos.org